I was a member of St. Douglas Freeman, and then I was a, a member of St. Pinchbeck, and then we finished building our first church, and then we were St. Mary's. <laughs> we were St. Mary's all along, but we went to those places to church, and I've been a member since 1962. When it all started, it was nothing more than a name. I had been um, attending Mass on Sundays at uh, Douglas Freeman High School, and at some Mass there, we were introduced to Father Ray, who was the founding pastor of St. Mary's. Quickly moved from Douglas Freeman to our next door neighbor at Pin Pinchbeck School. Eventually, uh, for Sunday Mass, they had uh, um, a folding chairs, and they would set up. Uh, they used that for the uh, for athletics, for um, serving meals. That's why they call it a cafetorium. So it's an auditorium, cafeteria, and used for multiple purposes and for Sunday Mass and for other services. It was hard to get used to because of what we, we came from the north. We came from the Gothic style churches with the, you know, with the stations all around and with the huge altars. Coming down here and see, walking into the gymnasium uh, and sitting in, uh, in portable, portable seats, not even benches, was a, was a eye opener. Uh, but it was a young parish and we were young people. We all started uh, being involved with the school, and that was a very big motivator for everybody in the parish to kind of get together. You know, they formed bake sales and, you know, things that would get a, a parish going. As, as a community, as a parish, we were all young, all just starting out, we all had young families. We were all new. Everybody was new. They built the school first. Mm -hmm and uh, the parish hall, which was a gymnasium, and my kids all went to St. Mary's. Mm -hmm. So I was very involved in the school life, you know, making hamburgers and <laughs> stuff like that. I think it was one of the hardest working groups I've ever met. We all pitched in to do things. When we first came here, um, we had a kindergarten, but no uh, grade school was built yet. And um, so we, this was back in the busing days, we bused our children to a cathedral uh, for first and second grade, uh, the first two years. And um, then, and we just had to keep raising money. So we all pitched in and did it. We had card uh, parties and almost every, at least every other Sunday we would have a bake sale. And uh, it was just really one of the highlights of, of my early um, married life because I got to be a part of this and met so many wonderful people here. The baptismal font in the first building font of the church was to the right of the altar, right at the top of the three steps. And it was cement. It was like cement blocks. And they always had to warm the water. So somewhere there was a switch that they would throw. And we sat, the McNamara family sat like in the second row, kind of in front of this baptismal font. And Peter, my late husband, leaned over to me. He said, what is that noise? I said, I don't know. Stop talking in church. And Richard, I think it was either Richard or Susan, leaned over and said, I think it's the water boiling in the baptismal font. The water was boiling. Something had gone wrong with it, and it was the bubbling up of the water. By and large, the attitude of the parishioners was uh, very positive, very upbeat. Uh, a lot of young people, young families involved, because this whole area out in Western Henrico was uh, fairly new and developing, a lot of new construction, new houses and things like that. And I think, you know, a lot of people were, had, had previously had to send their children to school, for example, uh, at some other parish other than here because we didn't have a school when we first opened up. So uh, when the school opened, there was a lot of support for that. And uh, 
you know, a lot, a lot of enthusiasm, I think, a lot of people interested in, in seeing, make things go and accomplish things. My leaving from Cuba was kind of a um, bittersweet. I was only 18 years old, so I knew that we were coming to a country where we would have freedom. That's what my parents wanted to leave uh, Cuba. But on the other hand, it was something very new. We knew some, it would be something completely different. Knew very little English, not much, but uh, still. And um, part of the um, very exciting and at the same time sad uh, experience coming was that I was uh, um, given a baby six months old to bring to the United States because her parents uh, felt it was the only way that if they had a daughter in the United States, they could later on come to the United States. Um, this family didn't know me from previous you know, life or anything, just met me at the airport with my father, asked my father permission if uh, it was okay with him to bring this little baby, and that family would be waiting for the baby. So at 18, I left Cuban with a little baby in my arms, hoping that she would be opening the doors to her uh, parents to come to the United States. Fifteen years later, I had the opportunity to meet this girl again in Miami, Florida. And it was very exciting to see that all the family was reunited. So now talking about my coming to Richmond, my husband was a professor at the University of Richmond. So when we got married in Spartanburg, South Carolina, I moved to Richmond. And um, shortly after I came to um, Richmond, I moved to the area. And I really liked uh, the idea of St. Mary's, not only because I, it was a, a new parish, a uh, lot of uh, different um, people, ethnicities and different ages, young people, older people, but the school, and that was my uh, really a great interest to uh, know that my children could attend a Catholic school. So um, St. Mary's it seemed just perfect for my family. Well, here at St. Mary's, the, uh, the pattern of our parish life reflects some of those changes that the Second Vatican Council called for. So we were founded in 1962, just as the Second Vatican Council was being convened uh, by Pope John XXIII, and no one knew for certain what that council would mean and how it might change parish life. So at the beginning of this parish's life, I think many of the families involved in creating uh, a new parish may have thought that it would just be like every other parish they had experienced in the 1940s and 50s. And then the Second Vatican Council comes along and a new era of creativity is unleashed in the whole church and uh, those families who were beginning to build a parish here on Gayton Road uh, were energized by that uh, vision of parish life that had been given to us by the council and so here at St. Mary's what we've seen almost from the beginning is a real dedication to enabling every person to be involved in ministry in the way that they feel called to and gifted for. And that has just blossomed in a number of ministries that continues to grow and ways in which we try to make a difference in the lives of our neighbors. Father Kelly was just an amazing priest and I think without a doubt gave some of the best homilies you know that I've ever heard in my life. I couldn't when I was a when I was growing up I it was at a time where um, you know where he had a great influence at my age at the time had a great influence on my faith and on on the way I participated in church because his homilies were just fantastic and he was such a great person. You, you couldn't wait to go, to go to church when you knew Father Kelly was going to be there. Well, the band's name was After Five, and, and it started in 1974. Uh, in 1978, Rebecca Oxenrider called me, and we started a yearly thing. It was, I believe it was a fundraiser. I'm not positive, but it was, it was billed as the parish dinner dance. It was an annual event, and uh, our band ended up playing it like 25 years in a row. We, we, it was a wonderful event. It was down in the 
in the gym. And uh, acoustics weren't the greatest, but it always sold out. It was, it was just a fun time. And built 350, 400 people pretty comfortably. And then as the years progressed, I think Chef Paul uh, became involved in the, in the dinner. I don't believe he did it initially, but early on he, he got involved in the kitchen and uh, made it an even more popular event. But a very special time was with Father Kelly, with Monsignor Kelly after that, when we started a fundraiser for the church. The dinner dance, which we had for uh, four, five years. That was my greatest satisfaction I had at that time. And, the, and then we had Father Rigel, which was before. Father Rigel. We were very busy on our job. The so on uh, Ash Wednesday, Father uh, Rigel, Rigel or, and who, or any or, other who, yeah, would come to the restaurant and bring us the ashes and, bring us the ashes and put <laughs> it on our head. <laughs> so, you know, we mm -hmm. had a job of 15, 18 hours a day, and for me it was very tough too. Mm -hmm. But I arranged it, I made it. Mm -hmm. We made it. At those dinners, what we'd normally have is a gathering for cocktails and hors d'oeuvres in advance. It was great fellowship. Chef Paul would come in in his chef's hat, introduce his staff, tell us what we'd be having for dinner. There was great excitement in the air. We'd have a sumptuous dinner, followed by music and dancing. Well, it's always been an amazing community of people, and that has held true since I first walked in the door. And I have to say, every day when I come here, it's as exciting as the very first day I ever entered here. It really is. You don't know who you're going to see. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what you're going to be called on, how you're going to be called on to serve, whatever that is. Um, so I would say it was a really active, smaller, but active community of very generous, kind people oriented to outreach, um, oriented into serving, and um, where the celebrations of liturgy were joyous. Um, and this wasn't, I guess, all that long after Vatican II. I had come from Boston, where the liturgies were quite different. And I think different dioceses probably implemented um, the changes brought about by Vatican II in different ways. Um, so I, we came here and it was like, this is amazing. It's really about community, and it's celebrated in community. 1975, Vietnam fell, and all these Vietnamese were coming into the country. And so we decided as a, a community group that we'd sponsor a family. So we ended up sponsoring a family of eight and then 12 and then 15. <laughs> um, and uh, that kind of you know brought us together as a community too because it was such a great experience. And uh, that led me into a job with the diocese, so I, was, <laughs> I resettled refugees for a long time. You know, uh, communism, I, that the worst, the worst thing in the world. You know, I was working as a military, and then uh, I was working corporate with uh, military intelligence, corporate to, you know, control the war, so whatever. Killing stop, and uh, people die. You know, by starvation, murders, or something. A lot of killing. So, I'm the lucky one still alive. Almost two million was killed. Seven million. Back then, Cambodia has seven million population, and almost two million or two million, I think was killed, you know, a lot. I'm the one lucky, my family. I like people to know about St. Mary Church. I feel like they're very special for me in my life. Because of my life better and stable, feel comfortable because of St. Mary Church. You know, I never forgot my life. We ended up getting the uh, award from HUD to build a 112 unit apartment complex for the elderly and handicapped. And that's how Marywood came about. A few years later, uh, we ended up building St. Mary's Woods on a property adjacent to Marywood. St. Mary's Parish sold that piece of land to Saint, for St. Mary's Woods. And the money that was used for that 
uh, or the money that was received on the sale of that property, uh, a good portion of that was set aside by St. Mary's Parish as an endowment fund for human concerns to help people that needed assistance to help the poor. And so that money is still in use today, is still in that endowment fund, and each year St. Mary's Human Concerns Committee is able to make contributions to various uh, charitable organizations in the area to benefit them from the proceeds from that, the earnings from that uh, endowment fund. I think the most important uh, aspect of the church, of the design feature, was to realize that the church's gift through the ages has been to provide structures and spaces that shape people in faith. And so for me, the opportunity to do that and to make sure that that happened at St. Mary's was a wonderful opportunity and a rich experience. Uh, design elements uh, like the 12 columns that are in the church, the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 apostles, uh, the eight candles that surround the baptismal font, the eighth day, which symbolized eternity, uh, seven days to create the world, the eighth day is eternity. Uh, the opportunities to have the altar at the center of the worship space, that Christ reality is there, to have the signs of, in the center of the altar that's carved in wood, uh, re replicated in the window, the stained glass window, and integrated into the cross, so altar, Blessed Sacrament and Crucifix as part of one reality. So it was for me a wonderful chance to integrate lots of theology as well as wonderful art. There are so many elements of design that um, are rich in symbolism. Just the shape of it, for one thing, you can see almost everyone and feel their enveloping proximity to you, you know, just, it feels like we're all just around each other. And, and yet, um, with the altar right in the center like that, you definitely know where the focus is. So just the, the, um, the way that it's laid out is important. And I think, uh, secondly, I love the stained glass windows. They're each unique, which just reminds me of each uniqueness of, of each parishioner and how we all come together into a beautiful design. I think some of the uh, uh, lines of architecture are different than traditional type of churches that we see uh, in older uh, architecture of churches. It combines the new and the old, and it uh, certainly sets aside uh, the past and brings with it a uh, current look. I think that uh, uh, the statues, the uh, paintings, are not what we traditionally see, and so that uniqueness is there. And uh, that big open space in the, in the uh, church itself, uh, now that it's there, if you walked in and didn't know it, it's conducive to baptisms, to celebrations, to marriages, to many different uh, occasions and special events that uh, you wouldn't have in a narrow aisle or in a traditional type of church. And it's convenient for every seat in the house to, uh, to look and participate and feel a part of the entire uh, service that's going on. I think Father Lewis, uh, you can see his input, his artistic input all over the place. And uh, we, we were very fortunate to have him honchoing it through. You uh, had to envision, you know, like when they uh, tore down, not to remodel the, the original church, and we were out back in the parish hall. That's actually where I started out when we would come here visiting friends, so I, I had been to their parish hall before. It was quite uncomfortable down there, but you know, you knew that there was a, a very nice new bigger space going to be available soon and, and actually time just went went past. You just worked around it. 
there were some activities that we kind of had to put on the back burner for a while until we had more space to to work but um, everybody just worked around it. For many years teach I was teaching religion and as I, after I moved up into the middle school, we had two of each a grade, six, seven, and eight. So for many, many years, I was teaching six classes of religion. And the kids knew that was my passion. We'd have more fun acting out the gospel, doing all kinds of activities besides just the textbook. It could be pretty boring. And two of the things that they really, really enjoyed were going over and discussing the gospels for that coming weekend. And again, you know, teachers would say, you're doing the same thing six classes in a row. And I said, yeah. Doesn't it get tiring? No, because each class brought something to it. And because of that, it brought something to me. And my faith was deepened so much by working with these middle schoolers. One year at Christmas time, we would work with the kids Christmas Eve children's mass which was like a zoo. And we had the little nativity pageant going and I was had to get Joseph from one side of the church around the back and down the other side. And we were three, four deep against the walls. And I'm trying to get him through. Well, I guess people thought I was just trying to shove my way on through. And finally, I had to say to them, please, would you let us, I have to get Joseph to the other side. Jesus is about to get, you know, be born and he needs to be there. And it was almost like Moses parting the water. The people just, and I was able to get Joseph around to the front where he needed to be. This is a tradition that we're not, that we don't really do currently, but it was a great tradition that, that, um, that Father Lewis had when he was at the churches um, at Christmas Eve. Um, he would give the homily and he would invite all the children to come down and, and sit in front of the altar. And he'd put out, he called it the magic rope. And if they were inside of the magic rope, they had to be quiet. And it was great. He'd get right down there and, and talk with the kids. And then after the homily, he would ask all the children to close their eyes. Um, and he would start singing Silent Night. And, and the whole parish would have their eyes closed and everyone would be singing Silent Night. And what, what would happen at that point is they'd have a young couple in the parish with a newborn child dressed as Mary and Joseph and with their baby swaddled. And while the children's eyes were closed, the couple would process in and sit down at the altar. And then when the children opened their eyes, you know, they would see Mary and Joseph sitting there. Well, we were fortunate enough to be picked a couple times to be Mary and Joseph since we had four children. And uh, just the sitting on that altar and seeing these children open their eyes and they're wide-eyed, you know, staring at us. It was just a, just a magical moment and just a, um, really, uh, made you just feel really connected to, to what Christmas is all about, you know, and that's the, and that's the birth of Jesus. And I think it really brought it home to the children. And I think it's something they'll never forget. And I know it's something our children, not the ones that we were carrying at the time, but our children that were watching will never forget. So it, it was a very special, a great tradition. Maybe, maybe it was only for a short time, but it was uh, definitely very memorable. And it was a, a great little uh, uh, event that, that Father Lewis brought to St. Mary's. I would like the people of St. Mary's in the future to, to really have the same feelings that I have now of the support, the caring, the love. It's, it's my family. And if you don't have family, you don't have much. And we have such wonderful ministry leaders. The, our human concerns ministry is always there for people. Um, just to know that St. Mary's is a loving, caring, supportive community, and that we need to continue that and keep that going for future generations.
On the local level, uh, we have uh, men and women of the parish dedicated to paying attention to the needs of our most immediate neighbors, uh, the folks that live in houses and apartments nearby us, some of whom are refugees from other countries or folks who are struggling because of economic hardships. And we try to find out what are their real needs and how can we as a parish uh, reach out and, and try to begin to meet those needs. And so we have numerous uh, parishioners who do that. And that's a local kind of outreach. Our outreach is also global, as we have a long and sustained history of twinning with parishes in Haiti. And the, the, the bulk of that work is done by members of the parish who sit in the pews and who have both a passion and a skill for working with our brothers and sisters in Haiti to build schools and to, to create health clinics and to dig wells and to improve agriculture. Uh, the priests don't have many courses in agriculture, but the people in our pews do and when they feel called to share that knowledge in a, in a gentle way with people far and wide they do that and so here at St. Mary's we see from you know trying to reach out to our neighbors or our neighbors in Haiti or around the world uh, our parishioners are doing that. I, th I think it's just being part of a community of faith as we uh, work through all of the issues and all of the things that, that become um, heightened as children are involved uh, we really learn how to practice our faith and, and how to bring that forward to a generation of students that um, are learning it as well as developing it at the same time we're learning and developing it. Um, I find personally that each day brings a whole new experience of, wow, I didn't know that. Um, and it's important to, to, to kind of keep up with your faith development and understanding of your faith. And the students actually give us a, a real challenge in doing that. They ask great questions. Um, their parents ask great questions. They want to know why things are, are being taught the way they're being taught, especially in our religion program. And it's a great opportunity to help research that, learn about that, and become part of that. Um, the school has a really close relationship with the parish, so all of the parish ministers um, help us to do that. Um, starting with Father Renninger, he's been terrific. Um, Father Lewis prior to that has really, both, both have really tried hard to impart a spirituality that um, all of us can espouse and, and learn from and grow from. So not only are the children learning, but also the faculty, staff, and certainly myself. It was very interesting to be involved in the school. When it began, it was very small. And being with it as we grew to a school that had waiting lists, where people were waiting outside overnight, camped out just to obtain a spot for their children in class. And looking at now, we've got a blue ribbon school and an international baccalaureate program. We had no idea we'd get to where we are, but it's great to have all those things now. St. Mary's School is a wonderful faith-based community. In any school, you expect to have a great education and to have wonderful teachers as role models. In St. Mary's, you have all that but you also have a wonderful faith-based community that helps build each other up, and it also gives you a moral compass from which to work. Well, Father Mike definitely makes our parish special. He has some great homilies. Sometimes when we go to other churches, I miss him speaking. Um, our beautiful church, I love the sanctuary, and Sister Pat, she's so awesome. I love getting hugs from her every Sunday. I guess it's the people here at the church that really makes it special. We make a ticket for the Christmas giving tree and all of the details are on the gift that you want to give. And we put about 1,500 tags on the Christmas tree every year and they are always all taken by members of this parish. So this parish is up around 2,000. Sometimes it's bicycles, well, there are bicycles lined up in the lower commons a lot, a lot of bicycles for kids. But 15 or close to 2,000 gifts sometimes. I oversee all the outreach ministries, of which there are about 28 ongoing outreach ministries here in the parish, um, and the social justice ministries, so that we also begin to look at how can we work structurally to create change to benefit all God's people, um, have people more on the playing field, to help people to be able to get their own voices, that we are not voices for them, but that they are now finding ways to find their own voice and step into the ring um, and not be marginalized. Um, so, you know, every day here in the office, um, I work with people who come in for various needs. The thing is we can't really fix everybody's problems, 
We can't monetarily take care of all the needs that are out there, and they are great, great, great. Even in our neighborhood here, I think we look like a middle-class place. Um, we've got Section 8 housing in our backyard where people are struggling. We've got neighbors who are struggling. Um, but we can hear everybody. We can resource everybody. We can journey with everybody. And I found in all these years, sometimes that's as critical a piece as you know being able to pay $100 on a gas bill or something. So we try to serve people the best we can with the resources we have here. And we are very blessed here with resources. The generosity of this community is amazing. Uh, you know, we don't have to look, you know, more than, you know, pretty much outside our door to find people in need and, and how fragile, you know, our whole system really is that it can take just one event to, to, you know, to get things rolling in the wrong direction. But it also just impressed upon me that, you know, those of us or places like St. Mary's that are so blessed that we have to share those blessings however we can. And basically the role of a parish nurse is to provide information, education, support groups, uh, facilitate uh, the health needs and, and focus on wellness, but also provide resources when people are in trouble and trying to figure and wend their way through our complicated health care system. Over the years, acting as a parish nurse and also I do the bereavement support group here periodically. So my individual encounters with people, sometimes I'm really not aware of what my words have done until much later somebody might mention to me how I help them and I've just oftentimes kind of reflect back in amazement that what I said actually had left an impression or changed somebody's lives. And I find that very humbling because I don't, I don't think of myself as being capable of changing somebody else's life. But they have really changed mine. One of my, one of my favorite memories of St. Mary's, and I get emotional, you know, just thinking about it, is, uh, is praying the rosary, you know, with our Knights of Columbus. Um, we meet once a month as, as a council, uh, and often we'll take time out, uh, or a few times a year, to pray the rosary together uh, for different reasons. And it's amazing to sit there in a room with 40 or 50 guys praying the rosary on a Monday night, and I think about that image. You know, if somebody were to walk down the hallway and see that, it's just, it's, it's an amazing display, you know, of our faith to see a group of men taking the time to do that because you just don't see that. And I would never have experienced that without St. Mary's. One thing about joining any of the ministries with the church is you really get to know the people. And uh, no matter what's gone on over the last 24 years, you know, ups and downs and stuff, it is the people that keep me here and um, th that this is part of my faith. I guess I would have to say that my experience of community at St. Mary's was so strong that I can't even imagine growing up as a, you know, into adulthood without having that kind of a community that you knew every Sunday you could turn to and people would care about you and, and support you. One of the wonderful things is coffee after mass because people get to linger and have conversation. And it's also, if you also get to see people you don't often see that may be coming to another mass that you have history with because we become pretty, what mass do you go to? <laughs> Um, one of the most rewarding things I find about being a part of St. Mary's Parish is how they reinforce the Christian morals. Small things such as freedom and truth and kindness and loving all people no matter what. Father Mike always reiterates that though it may be hard to forgive and to love all people, that's still a Christian belief and a Catholic belief and you need to work to better that and I love how honest he can be and all other parishioners at St. Mary's can be when they say that and they understand that 
Yes, it's hard to forgive or it's hard to love her. It's hard to be honest and truthful or loyal at times, but that's something that we all need to work with and we all have the image of God and Jesus to make us strive to do that. And it, though it can be hard, we can find help through prayer or meditation or going to confession and helping us in facilitating that. And I think having that and having members of our church who are there to support us is one of the most rewarding things. Our church was built over several phases. We were founded in 1962. Our first building consists of a multi-purpose gymnasium, which was also used as a church and a parish hall and for many other functions with the school. We also had a school office, a couple office buildings, some classrooms, a dining hall. But we outgrew that very quickly. By 1966, we added more classrooms. And in 1984, we started our first major church project and we built that church, as well as a daily mass chapel, office space. And by the early 1990s, we outgrew that. In 1995, we dedicated a middle school wing with additional classroom space, and we revitalized our church inside. By 2000, we started the next phase. And by 2007, we dedicated our new church, our new daily mass chapel, new office space, and many, many uh, conference rooms for our many ministries usage. You know, we started in 1962, with 350 families. 50 years later, we're over 2,300. Quite an achievement. Every month after one of the Sunday Masses, we have a brief program that allows new members to register as parishioners, and we use that opportunity to tell them a little bit about our parish's history. And as part of that process, I tell the new parishioners that we really stand on the shoulders of the folks who were here at the beginning of this parish's life. Uh, because if you think about it, they have graciously and generously sacrificed over the last 50 years to make sure that we as a parish have everything we need in order to do the work of the gospel. Now, at the beginning of our parish's life, that meant that we needed buildings and classrooms and chairs and tables and places for the parish to gather. And over the past 50 years, that meant that we built not one, not two, but three churches on one piece of property uh, so that this growing parish could have a home for worship. Well, in some ways, uh, the first 50 years of parish life has been uh, the work of creating the home, the buildings, the space for the church. And I think over the next 50 years, it's my hope that our parish will continue to build up people and their lives and their love for the Lord and the ministry of the church so that 50 years from now, people will look back and say, thank goodness for that generation in 2015 who made the decision to be generous and to be faithful and who kept looking forward to say, what do we have to do next and who do we have to be next in order to be faithful to Jesus? Mm -hmm.